And welcome back to Frankly Speaking in Conjunction with Mayhe Ray. Joining me on the line tonight is my good friend, Julian DeMarco. How are you, Julian? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. I hope you had a great Christmas. I did. I had a really good, relaxing Christmas. Fantastic. I mean, I fantastic. Yeah, I had a great Christmas, too, with the family and uh, one of the best ever. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, so, you know, I called up Julian today and, um, you know, me and Julian, our last cast we did, I asked him a question about Protestantism and whether Protestants could ever build culture. Because the more I look at America and a lot of its dysfunctions that we have, primarily the lack of uh, culture, the lack of common values, how we're always at each other's throats, especially politically in many respects, I think is due to a lack of culture. And I've always kind of related this problem back, Julian, really to the dogmatic anarchy we see within Protestantism. And the question really still resides in my mind, can America in this kind of Protestant Freemasonic mold, but we'll just, we'll just focus on the Protestant aspect today. Uh, can America ever succeed in ever building true culture? And the more you study Protestantism in America specifically, the more I see a problem with it. Now I get it, Julian, in old Europe, you know, old line Protestant, mainline Protestant churches in Europe, you could probably find some elements of culture there, though I think it's a descending kind of a culture that eventually turned into sort of more modern Protestantism, particularly what we see in the evangelical America today. But my question to you is this, can a nation founded on Protestant principles from its founding origins, can it really create culture, first of all, and can it ever create common values so we all kind of live in somewhat peace and harmony in some respects when we consider the fact that, again, Protestantism is in a state of dogmatic anarchy? Uh, yes, um, I think Protestants can create culture. Well, it, well, what, first off, we have to define our terms. Well, what is culture? What isn't culture? And how is culture created? And how is it not created? I think those are things that we need to, to define um, first. But I do think that Protestants can create culture. Uh, for example, England as an Anglophile. I, I, I'm much more familiar with England and its history and stuff like that. There is a difference between Catholic England and Protestant England, specifically uh, British, the union of the Crown of England and the Crown of Scotland and creating this ubiquitous Britishness. Now, the whole, and it's born out of Protestantism. So there, but it is also born from the fact that Anglicanism has a lot of Catholic overlay with a lot of Protestant um, Protestant ethos and theology with a heavy Catholic veneer. So, but for America, one of the issues is that it doesn't have a defining Protestant ethos necessarily. Although the Eastern half does, um, Manifest destiny is very um, Puritan. So I, so let me take that back. I would say that the overarching Protestant um, defining feature of this country is Puritanism, but it is, but it's really hard to pinpoint how this Puritanism is over dominating the culture. Although there are some aspects that are very um, easy to pinpoint, like money and working. If it doesn't make money, if it can't sell, then we won't, then we don't want to have anything to do with it. Like right. as Charles Coulomb says all the time, with like with art, we don't put a lot of money into art because art can't make money. And so therefore the beautification just for the sake of beauty, it, it's not something that people spend a lot of money on because 
in a Puritan work ethic, if it doesn't make money, if it can't sell, if it can't be something that can be for your livelihood, then it isn't worth having. So that is a very Puritan um, mindset and cultural mindset. But there are other, you know, other Protestant aspects that aren't Puritan that come into this country. So it makes this country have a, a really essentially a melting pot of Protestant cultures that are trying to dominate over each other. Yeah, and I think you hit it right on the button uh, in regards to a bunch of Protestant cultures and we're trying to figure out what is what ultimately at this point in American history. I, I agree with you. I think, like I said in my opening, um, you know, there was, I think, some elements of Protestant culture in Europe um, for a while there after the Protestant Reformation, but a lot of that had to do exactly what you said, and that is, it was really, you know, they were copying Catholicism, and in many respects, they just took what they knew from the Catholic Church, and, you know, again, trying to break from some dogmatic disagreements that they had with the Catholics, primarily, I would argue, trying to find an accommodation of sins below the belt, um, and, and they took what they saw as worthy uh, that, you know, again, accommodated what it is they, they wanted to sort of create. But I, for my part, you know, I look at Protestantism and the way it's devolved over the past 500 years, and I don't think that's by accident. And, you know, we have an American culture. I think America's a, a great example of this, right? Because in many respects, we are this experimental ground for Protestantism because Catholicism never actually existed here as a dominant force. Sure, it was in parts of, you know, you know, some some rural parts like in, in the South and then up in Canada areas and things like that. It had a presence, but it was never a dominant force. You can't say that America was founded on Catholic principles. It's one of those nations that's very rare. And so Protestantism was allowed here to sort of exist and breed in and of itself. And what we see really from the earliest days, from the moment the Constitution is enshrined, you know, under this concept of religious liberty, which fit Protestantism very well as it continued to splinter. And in many ways, it ratified and justified what these breaks within Protestantism. We see all these, again, evolving cults with a lot of different beliefs, Julian. I mean, you know, you got an Anglican church in America here that's trying to create its its sort of its its influence in America, but it's not working because America, unlike England, is a vast land. It's it's big, it's wide, and the institutional apparatus, which was the Catholic Church, excuse me, which was the Anglican Church, which took the sacraments or some of the sacraments like the Catholics, it was difficult to administer these sacraments in, in a land that was very well, big, let's be honest. And this is when you see the likes of George Whitfield, right? And we change what it means to be a Christian from, you know, doing these certain acts, getting baptized, following the Lord to this experience of being saved, which was new, which was novel. And we begin to see culture begin to change as a result of these doctrinal changes within America. And this is why, Julian, Protestantism in America has always been kind of strange. And it's always been, and it's really been really different than even historical Protestantism in Europe. Well, one of the things is because Protestantism in America has been very um, anti-intellectual and it has also been very emotional based. Yes. If, I, I've talked about this before um, and I know I always talk about Charles Cologne, but it's because, you know, he talks about similar things as well. And so I use him as, as a as a reference because he is such a um dearth of information uh, but protestantism in europe tends to be much more intellectual much more liturgical um much more historical um and it tends to be less emotional in america you have the great revival the great awakening you, you talked about Whitfield, you know, you have the Holy Rollers, you have the fundamentalists, that it's just me and my Bible, you don't need to have any type of education, um, you don't need to have any type of theology degree to, to, really, uh, to really understand Christianity. Uh, history about Christianity is also 
you know, in Protestantism, in America at least, is, you know, somewhat, you know, lacking the, the, history, uh, the history of their own Protestant sect, let alone the history of Christianity in general, is frowned upon. So in America, you have Protestants that are very, I, I want to say in all, you know, plain terms, you know, stupid. Um, it, it's just that they, they're not ones, that, they're very anti-intellectual. And you can see this to this day with our masters, our politicians, uh, you know, who talk a good game about being intellectual or being smart or book smart or whatever the case may be. But if you actually really listen to them, they really don't actually have a good grasp of history, nuance, context of any of these things. Uh, it's, it's, it's really also emotions. If you ever really listen to, say, like um, Biden, for example, he doesn't, I know it's not really, I know this might be a bad example because he doesn't really talk intelligently to begin with, but he just talks about emotions. And this, if you listen to any politician, whether it is Trump, Bush, Obama, it doesn't really matter who the politician is, right, left, it doesn't really matter, but it's really all just emotions. And, and this idea of really basing stuff in history, tradition, the context of that history, where that history comes from, uh, and why why it matters and how it plays out, uh, it, it's very important. You know, one of the things that um, you know Charles was also saying, which I also have said before, and which is really true, is if you actually read a lot of history books, if you actually know. Uh, what is going on. Like, for example, if you have a good working knowledge of what's going on in the Middle East and some talking head um, from the mainstream media is going on about how something is going on in the Middle East and basically all they're saying is you need to rage. Well, if you have a historical understanding about what's going on in the Middle East and you look at this talking head and they're basically saying rage, rage, rage about what's going on in the Middle East, you'll be able to say, well, that's all good, but I'm not going to rage because I have a historical understanding of what's going on in the Middle East, even though this is a new development for today. Generally, these things have been going on forever in the Middle East. So I'm not right. going to rage about something that is always going on in the Middle East. Right. But if they're not if you don't have a historical context of what's going on in the Middle East and, you, and you're listening to this talking head and basically all they're saying is rage, 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 well, you're going to rage because you have no other, you have no other context to put what is going on there. And that's interesting is because none of these talking classes ever say read a book, learn history. They're always just talking about surface level things. I know this was a bit of a tangent, but I think it all comes together. No, it does. It does. Because I think even when I was in the classical liberal camp, the one thing I could tell you is that history begins in 1776. And everything that comes before that, in many respects, for a lot of classical liberals, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You know, for me, it's it's all about ancestral roots. You talk about, well, what is culture? What is culture? Um, you know, we could talk about language, right? We could talk about food. We could talk about customs. We could talk about religion and mores. But for me, Julian, what I know is that my Catholic faith was handed down to me by my parents. And my parents got it from my grandparents. And my grandparents got it from my great grandparents. There's a there's a line of succession there, right? Where there these these are cherished beliefs. Now, obviously, they're based upon the, the eternal truths and the gospels, of course, right? That goes all the way back to our Lord through the, the through the Catholic Church, our faith, our church, our great church throughout history. But when you look at Protestants, and I said this before, right? You can be a Protestant father and a mother, right? You can go, let's say you're Baptist and you could 
You could have three kids, and those three kids, as they grow up, can venture out into any form of Protestant denomination they want. One year, your child could be a Methodist, another could be an evangelical, another one can be a Mormon. At the end of the day, they're all still Protestants. At the end of the day, there's really no big confusion, no big contradiction here. And yet you got a family that even in the most subtle ways, you know, while Methodists, Mormons, and Baptists may all have common values, there are subtleties in regards to morality and, and principles of life. And these subtleties through multi sort of generational process, they do change the family in and of itself, never mind the broader culture. You're asking me what is culture, consistency in our faith and religion. Again, to quote, as you have so, so beautifully, Charles Cologne, he talked about the Sicilian island when we interviewed him a few months back and you know what makes this pluralistic island that was conquered by all these different tribes of people from Muslims to the Normans to the Greeks it was the Catholic faith that consolidated an ideology and belief in God that brought these people together it's where pluralism can work and it's a fine example where pluralism has worked where in America it's different because there's nothing unifying again I'll go back to the dogmatic anarchy of Protestantism. While the Catholic Church was able to unify a Sicilian island, Protestantism, Ju Julian, failed in ever consolidating America. I think that's, a, that's a, a testimony of some of the problems that Protestantism creates. And I believe really the origins of a lot of the problems that we have as Americans today. Well, so I think Protestantism did solidify this nation because it is a Protestant country, but there mm -hmm. is no dominating, there is no dominating Protestant faith. Although, according to numerous polls and surveys, the largest denomination of um, Protestants in this country are Methodists. But that, but the country isn't Methodist. There is no dominating. Um, Protestant uh, force for, or religion, because there is this freedom of religion or separation of religion or whatever the case may be. But what is interesting is that, you know, the Constitution says that, you know, there will be a separation of church and state. It says that the federal government will not force or make a federal religion for the country. But that does not mean that states cannot have individual religions. I mean, uh, for, for the longest time, states had an official state religion. I think it was one of the Virginia states was one of the last states in recent history, and when I mean recent, within the last hundred years or less, officially removed uh, its official religion off the books. So. When people say, oh, well, there's a separation of church and state, da 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 da, they don't really understand. They don't even, again, they don't understand the historical context of their own country. And they, th which that means is that the federal government won't make a religion. But that says nothing about the state endorsing an official religion. And, and so it, it, this country is Protestant. And so they did, I, uh, would say um, solidify this country, but it also stopped this country stopped itself from having one dominant force for the whole entire state. Right. Uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, know. Julie. Okay, no, I, and I get your point, but here's here's my question: How can a state ever endorse an official religion when Protestantism itself is always evolving into something new? I mean, when you look at the again, you said the Methodists are are the biggest. I guess, uh, you know, Protestant clan here, evangelicalism, which is kind of a new phenomenon in the past hundred years, they've r risen to prominence. We've had those old line Protestant churches like the Anglican Church and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans all dying off. How can you have an official religion again when Protestantism itself can't stay in peace in accordance with itself? Well, so to answer your question about how can a state have an official religion, this goes back to the founding of the 13 colonies. Um, each state had its own, you know, religion. Um, Maryland, for example, was the Catholic state, hence the name Maryland. Um, so uh, each state would have its 
uh, religion. Um, I think um, Massachusetts was either Baptist or Lutheran or something. Uh, Virginia was some other, uh, I think it was Presbyterian maybe. Uh, I can't really remember which state was which, but these states which were founded by certain groups of people from a certain um, predominant, you know, uh, not predominant, but a certain group of Protestants, when they came to these states, they were given land by the British to be for those particular people. And if, you know, for Maryland, the, those, it was given to the Catholics and they were the predominant people in those lands. And so therefore the official religion of that colony was Catholicism. But I mean, that it didn't mean that you, everybody in that state or colony, had to be Catholic to live there. But that was the official religion of the of the colony. And so after you know the Civil War, or as it's called, the American War for Independence, happened, they still the fed, the state, the new state that is the United States, still kept that. And so each, although. The United States got rid of Maryland's uh, Catholicism as its official state religion. I don't know. I don't remember. It made it some other Protestant religion for that state. So, you know, uh, I think the Catholics may, if I, I it's, it's, it's different because, you know, it depends on how many people were, um, you know, how, how assimilated they were and how wealthy they were. You know, if you were a wealthy Anglican, you may have been more for um, the establishment. You may have been for the British. If you were a poor Catholic, you would have been for the British. If you were a wealthy Catholic, you would have been for the rebels. So it depends on you know on all these different factors. But to, but when the when the when the United States started and they you know were just the thirteen colonies, they have essentially kept you know the state religion. Uh, and then when they started adding new states and new territory, you know, these states would have their own state religion. It wasn't until, you know, the breakdown, essentially, of, uh, of the cultures of, uh, of a certain group of people, like for Scottish, for example, for Scottish people, uh, that a lot of Scottish people were in the Carolinas. It wasn't until, you know, they stopped being Scottish and just living in the new world and just started becoming this American, whatever that was, that they started losing their roots and becoming all these other things, that it became basically untenable for states to have re state religions because the dominating religion would no longer be the, the, whether the uh, ethnic groups, whether it's Scottish, Danish, or whatever have you, are no longer the majority in those states, and therefore their religious practices are no longer the dominating force in those yeah. states. And therefore, the states are not able to have a state religion. And then once you start getting into the uh, 20th century uh, and with the secularization really ramping up, especially after the First World War, um, you know, it just it, it just was unfeasible to have state religions after that point. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately my point, because as Protestantism evolves and sort of the new flavor, the new Protestant flavor of day pops up, as we've seen in modern times with evangelicalism, how does the a dying breed of Protestant church maintain control and power over a state? And see, and again, this goes back to sort of the chaotic mess, which is, you know, the lack of dogma that many Protestants have, right? And in and, and the ever devolving kind of ideological belief that it is. And, and that's why I believe, Julian, at the core of it all, it's it's really at the foundational problems of of America. Now, you contrast that to a nation like Italy, for example, that was deeply Catholic. The Protestant Reformation never hit it, just like it never hit really Spain all that much. Man, maybe a little bit Spain, but really Italy is a fine example of that. And 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 even, you know, as we learn through history, liberalism is forced into Italy precisely because it's a Catholic nation with strong Catholic culture. You have common beliefs. I mean, you know, listen, in Italy, even up until most recently, through liberal courts that did away with the crucifixes in the classrooms, we did away with religious imagery in America, you know, 
in, in a very short period of time, by the time the Supreme Court is taking away the concept of Christianity away from the public discourse in America. In Italy, it continued to exist. In places like Poland, it exists. Again, Catholic nations with culture, dogmatic beliefs, right? Foundational truths through history, uh, a lineage, again, of, of cultural roots and ancestry. But in America, we're all kind of bastard children that have been forced together, Julian. Nobody knows the rules of the game. Nobody understands the culture. Nobody has common values. And this is why every two and four years, we go to the election booth here to determine our moral principles through, again, the ballot box. And we're, ah, this is what we are as Americans, Julian. This is what Protestantism has given us. Is that a fair assessment or am I overreaching? I don't think you're overreaching. Uh, I think, though, it is, it's is—it's a combination of liberalism and Protestantism. Agreed. Agreed. Two, two things, though, that are um, of, the, uh, of the same coin on different sides. You know, the, the revolution will eat itself. It will eat its own children, and its children will eat its parents. Now, what is interesting is that you said, like, for Spain, during the Protestant Revolution, Spain, among other, Spain, I believe, and I, I've been reading up on Spanish history, specifically about uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, and I've read multiple biographies. Um, they are the, as far as I can tell from my own research, during the Protestant Revolution, because Spain had taken measures during the 1400s when the church was really corrupt, which led to a lot of the problems in the 1500s. They had taken out a lot of corruption. Almost, actually, all of its corruption was, um, was completely gone by the time of the Protestant Revolution. And so if Spain alone, out of any other country, was the only country that was not influenced by Protestantism or That's what I thought. Any, yeah. it had any um, issues with Protestant, uh, Protestantism. Now, what is interesting is that England as well, too, did not have a lot of corruption. It did have some corruption, but it, but it didn't have, a, it wasn't widespread, not like the continent. Uh, and and it had more than what Spain had, because Spain had taken, a, a, with Isabella and the archbishop and the cardinal, what was really, I, I know that Alexander Borgia gets a very bad rap, but he was, uh, he was from Valencia, which is, which is in the kingdom of Spain. And so that uh, reciprocal relationship between Isabella and uh, Alexander Borgia was very profitable. Um, for the church in Spain, uh, uh, Isabella the Catholic basically had carte blanche to a, a point uh, prelates over the church in Spain. And she was a very pious woman, if you know anything about her. And she, she appointed very pious, zealous prelates who made it their mission to remove corruption and to unify the church. Uh, in Spain now, in England, it had a lot of it had a it had really good prelates, and it had a few corrupt through a few corrupt things going on. But it wasn't like the continent, as I said. But what ended up happening is that there was a small minority of nobles who were Protestant, secretly Protestant, who wanted to change the country fundamentally, and. Henry VIII, who really, what, which is how he got the title of Defender of the Faith. If nobody, if you've never read Henry VIII's work, uh, The Defense of the Seven Sacraments, it's one of the, whatever your opinion of Henry VIII is, it's actually one of the best defenses for the seven sacraments. I know it's kind of weird thinking about Henry VIII in this way, but that's exactly how Henry VIII was given the title from the Pope, Defender of the Faith, because of his work for the seven sacraments. Now, when Henry VIII was having his marital troubles, he unfortunately surrounded himself with unsavory people who took advantage of the situation. And Henry VIII, wanting to get his divorce 
and wanting to get more money, use that as a way to, to, um, to usher in Protestantism, which was brought, which was a foreign entity to England. England, England would not realize until centuries later that they had been duped by Protestantism, but it was brought in by a, a small minority. It wasn't organic. It was, you know, if you look at a lot of stuff, you know, Catholic or Protestant, even, even like, especially Protestant, Protestant mm -hmm. historians that talk about England, that talk about Protestantism, will even talk about how Protestantism was seen as that German thing. It was foreign. It was yeah. not so yeah. it wasn't something that would come over here. So it was a small minority that brought Protestantism to England. And then well, it was a top down type of thing. Uh, and so that that is uh, one of those things that it's a it's a very uh, if you understand these contexts, these historical contexts, you'll have a better understanding of where uh, how Protestant moves and throughout the world and throughout history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's fascinating. And like and like I started off the show, I think European Protestantism was different because of its ties to Catholicism because it was it was founded off of Catholicism. And in many respects, it's a reaction from Catholicism. I think, again, to bring it back to the American system of Protestantism and some of the problems we face, it was a new experiment. And as an experiment, it evolved as an experiment, kind of, you know, shaking up the formula, so to speak. I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, individuals like George Whitman, for example, as I mentioned earlier, Julian, you know, we went from this lived experience within Christianity, right? you know, kind of not only faith and, and reading the scriptures and, and, and baptism, things like that. But we get to a point where in America, that ex that lived experience becomes an emotional experience. And George Whitfield in the, you know, again, 1800s, I believe is when it was right around there, because that's when we saw the kooky denominations begin to, to creep up. He changed it to a thing of, again, an emotional experience. And Protestantism in America has grown sort of in that spirit. You know, you talked about how it's anti-intellectual and that's exactly true. What is Protestantism today? It's kind of this kind of mashup between, you know, sort of this American economic engine of prosperity gospel mixed in with Christianity. We have the health and wealth gospel, which has become very dominant. You know, we got these mega preachers um, on television that make millions upon millions of dollars. Kind of different than how the the you know sort of the Catholic clergy operated. Not that there wasn't corruption there with money with Catholic clergy, but generally speaking, right? We go from a world where Christianity and its clergy believed in renouncing money, sex, and power, to where in America we got a form of Protestantism that praises and cherishes as a Christian virtue money, sex, and power, which is kind of kind of strange. And and that's why I say, Julian, only in America. Say it again. I, only in America will you find this type of Protestantism. <laughs> well, see, that's it's really foreign see, to the whole whole concept of old world European Protestantism. Yeah, yeah. I I just think I just think because old old world Protestantism had its ties to the Catholic world. It was born out of Catholic nations and Catholic cultures, and and, and it naturally had to accommodate for, at least for a while what your average person understood and knew so it wouldn't be so foreign that people would run away from it. You had to make it familiar, right? But listen, you come to America and by the 1830s, you got the Mormons running for Utah for crying out loud because this is completely different than anything we've ever seen throughout history. And, and we just build on it. And I mean, if you look just a general search on Wikipedia, right? And you look at all the history of Protestant denominations in America. I mean, they're just popping up one after the other. One generation after we enshrine religious liberty in the First Amendment, Julian. And I don't think that's a coincidence. There's about, I mean, there's 40,000 Protestant denominations. When people talk about that 40,000 Protestant denominations, what they, they need to be very specific about that. Because... That 40,000 really is America. Because in Europe, you're either, you're either Lutheran, you're either Anglican, or you're either, you know, um, some other, you know, 
other Protestant churches, and I, some of these Protestant churches wouldn't even call themselves Protestant uh, because some of these churches that aren't Protestant actually broke away from the Catholic Church a hundred years prior to the Protestant Revolution. So some of these some of these non-Catholic, non-Protestant churches, which I guess you could lump them in with Protestantism, are some of them are older than Protestantism itself. So you know there, but there, I guess you could probably say there are about thirty different strains of Protestantism, but they're all kind of really linked in with each other on the continent in Europe. But because what, there's just different kind of flavors of how to do it. Some are more conservative, some are more liberal, some are just, you know, um, you know, you have the Dutch Lutheran church and then you have the, the Swedish Lutheran church, you know, it, they're, 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 they're essentially the same Lutheran church, except one is just ethnically Swedish and the other one is just ethnically Dutch. So there's nothing really anything different about them other than the fact that they're just different ethnicities. But in America, as you have said, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. 40,000, all these denominations, which is, you know, you got your seven day Adventists, you have your Jehovah's Witnesses, you have your Mormons, you have your other apocalyptic cults, and you have your evangelicals, your mega churches, which evangelicals is purely, strictly, an American Protestant phenomenon. It is not an old school European, you know, started by some reformer in the 1500s. It's it's an American thing, which okay. it's just it's ridiculous. Okay. But you have you have all these things just popping up all over the place in America, specifically yeah. in the 1800s during these great revivals, and it's always by some river. It's it's in the water. Literally, it's in the water. <laughs> All right. So I'll go back to my initial question as we wrap up this podcast. Last question, I, Julian, and uh, I'm going to ask you that, that first question that I asked you in that last show and the question I asked you to start off this podcast, but with a little bit of twist. Can American Protestantism build culture? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> because... because they're too busy competing with themselves and splintering off. And there's no dominant, there's no real dominant ethnic culture here either. I mean, this isn't uh, a 300 million Swedes living here. It's the 300 million people from Asia, some African countries, a whole bunch of different European countries. They're, they're, they're not, so you can't have a, you cannot have a dominant Protestant culture when you don't actually have a dominant ethnic group to support that 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 ethnic protest that or not that ethnic but that that ethnic group to support that flavor of protestantism that is that is actually a brilliant analysis i wasn't even thinking of the cultural factors there we are just a mashup of different tribes and people that are trying to figure it out i guess doing it on the fly christianity on the fly and that's what we've seen in america and it's something that I've seen. I've talked to my wife, who was a Protestant one time. I asked her, you know, can Protestants build culture? Have you ever seen it? She goes, well, you know, they could build culture within their own little ranks, kind of within their own church structure, I guess, right? But extending out to the greater culture, I see very little of it. This is why it's so difficult for me to watch Protestant movies oftentimes, Julian, because, you know, they're, they're really in, in a world talking to themselves and, and, and can't relate in a lot of different ways. And... Um, so listen, this is not against Protestants. This is not against people who love the Lord and love Jesus. I'm just, you know, we're at a point in, in history here in America where things are falling apart. And I'm trying to get to the origins of this problem. We've been hard on classical liberals here. We've been hard on liberalism. I think, like you so beautifully said earlier, that the combination of liberalism and Protestantism here have left America in a state of chaos where we have really no culture. We don't know what the rules of the game are. The family is in utter ruination. And as we all are living through now, the political system is abjectly corrupt. I think, again, we've made the links here in, a, in at least in a very broad sense. I'm sure there's somebody out there that can 
pin tie these things a little closer than, than at least I have here. Julie, my friend, great cast. Again, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, my friend, uh, I want to thank my friend again, Julian DeMarco, May He Rain vlog. Check out his site. I'll put the link in the description. And this is Frank signing off for Frankly Speaking. Good night, everybody. Good night.